Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for this time together. And we just ask you, Father, in the name of Jesus, that your word go forth and encourage our hearts and touch our hearts and give us life for the coming week. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you brought your Bible, please open to John chapter 11. As you know, a week from today is Palm Sunday and two weeks Easter. And on Palm Sunday, we always look ahead to the fact that we're just a week away from Easter. But today, we're going to look ahead to the fact that we're a week away from Palm Sunday. And we're going to study an event that happened just about exactly one week before the triumphal entry. And it, had, it was the catalyst, actually, for both the triumphant entry of Jesus next week on Palm Sunday and the crucifixion because it caused such a stir that that's when people began to call for his death. Let's look at John 11, verses 1 and 2. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, in the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. His brother Lazarus was sick. Let's pause there. John wants us to recognize who Mary is. Mary is the one who adored him by pouring out precious ointment on his feet and worshiping him. And one thing I want to point out here is that the scripture is very clear that Lazarus, Martha, and Mary were some of Jesus' closest friends. You know, he was a human being like you and I. He had dear, close friends, and they were some of his dearest friends. In fact, don't turn there, but if we could look at Luke 10, verses 38 to 42, you'll remember this story where it's talking... Now, as they were traveling along, he entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came to him and said, Lord, don't you even care my sister's left me alone to do all this serving? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said, oh, Martha, Martha, you're worried and bothered about so many things. But only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. So if you remember this story, you'll recall that Martha went all out showing Jesus and his disciples hospitality. She had southern hospitality down pat. And Mary went all out cherishing the word of God and later cherishing Jesus himself as she poured out the ointment on his feet. So when we read in John 11 that Lazarus, their brother, is sick, this are not people on the periphery of Jesus' life. They were some of his dearest and most cherished friends. Let's go back to John 11, verse 3. So the sister sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. We're going to pause a lot in this. We're going to spend most of the morning in this one chapter, John 11. I don't think Mary and Martha were real upset at this point, even though they knew Jesus was really sick. I think that they'd seen Jesus heal so many people that in their mind they thought, well, all you have to do is get word of him. He's going to take care of it. Let's continue with verse 4. But when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he loved. Now, I want to tell you something, that doesn't make any sense. Does that compute? He loved them, so he stuck right where he was. In our minds, if he loves Mary and Martha and Lazarus, he jogs all the way back to Bethany and in a heroic gesture raises Lazarus up from a sickbed. But God had bigger plans. Yeah. You say, what's the point of this message? I'll tell you the point now. So I'll tell, I keep telling you point all the way through. God may have taken a different route to answer your prayers, but if he has, he's got bigger plans. Okay. Right. We have very definite, very well thought out preconceived notions. And we don't call them preconceived notions. We just know how God should do some things. We know what God should do and how he should do them and hopefully exactly the way he'll do them if he loves us. Uh -huh. Have you ever prayed and had something turn out just a way a little bit different or a little bit later? Okay. The main point of this message is that the end result of what Martha and Mary were trusting him for very definitely came to pass. They got their brother back. Hallelujah. God's desires were their desires. Yeah. You know, 3 John 2 says, 
Beloved, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. Now, what do you want more than to just prosper and be in health? Have a great life. God wants you to have a great life just as your soul prospers. So his desires and your desires are one and the same. He yes. loves you. But sometimes getting there takes a little bit different route. God took a different path to getting them to having their brother back. I believe a lot of us are exactly on the path toward getting a greater blessing and fulfillment in our lives. But if God takes a jog to the left when you plan to jog to the right, or if you're watching the clock and it doesn't happen on your timetable, do, this is, God spoke to me yesterday and I thought, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give people this and if they don't get anything out of it, I know I will. If somebody had told me it was going to take 27, almost 28 years to get to where this church was, when we were young and oh. enthusiastic and idealistic and yeah. we're going to conquer this town in two years and then go on to... Yeah. Man, yeah. <laughs> but you know, he never tells you how long it's going to take. Yeah. But when... Now listen. Uh -huh. Your faith may have suffered some setbacks, but that does not mean you're not going where you're going. Amen. Do we get offended and decide that God's heart motives toward us are not as pure as we thought? Or, when something happens that we don't understand and the timing is different, do we hold steady and trust Him with the future and wait and see how things play out? I want you to say this with me. It's not over till it's over. So let's go to verse 4. When Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is not unto death. I think these two sisters had probably given him in their minds about 24 hours for him to hightail it back to Bethany. You know, we, you know, we don't say that because we respect him. But I think in their mind, they have a day, day and a half to get there. And then they envision this glorious, dramatic resurrection from a sick bed. But Jesus had something bigger planned. Something so huge it would glorify God himself. In verse 6, it says, so when he heard that he was sick, he stayed put. Two days, stuck right there. Now, isn't this exciting? Uh -huh. Have you ever had God not move when you were explaining to him the absolute necessity of him moving now? Okay. You see, we always read this story looking back with the advantage of knowing in advance the outcome that Mary and Martha did not have that luxury. If they had had that luxury, they would have been sending out invitations and throwing the party. If they, you know the end of the story. I haven't mentioned it, but I think probably everybody here knows what happens to Lazarus. Well, if they'd known, they'd have been sending invites out to be sure everybody was there to the grand occasion. But instead, they were struggling with planning a funeral. Come on. Have you ever wrestled with a million questions about whether Jesus really cares about you as much as you thought he cared? Maybe you've never been there. Most of us have a meeting and say, oh, yeah, I've been there, but I don't say it too loud. Okay. So let's keep reading here, verse 6. So when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And then, after this, he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. But the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you want to go there again? Jesus answered and said, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. If anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now, what is the Lord saying here? He is walking in the light of a whole other realm. The light of the Holy Spirit is directing his steps and his timing. I'm talking to you today basically about the timing of God. Because you and I don't really get upset about anything else because you know why? Because if you hold on, you will get your answer. Amen. I'm just here to tell you God's faithful. I've held on and had God come through with things way after I thought it was possible for him to come through. Oh, it's quiet in here. The light of the Holy Spirit was directing his steps and his timing because life looks different in the light of heaven and the light of eternity. Time looks different. To these two sisters, the most important thing in the universe was that Lazarus be raised from that sick bed. But in Jesus' view of eternity, he understood that because of his being raised from the dead, many would come to believe in him who had not believed in him otherwise. 
Hallelujah. Verse 11. This he said, and after, he, after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may waken him out of sleep. And you say, why didn't he just tell me God? Well, let me ask you this. Did you know that Jesus had to, knew exactly what he had to have faith for? And what he had to have faith for was the biggest miracle that had ever happened from the foundation of the world. And you say, how is that? Well, about two weeks later, there was going to come a greater miracle. Yeah. When he was raised from the dead, it's the greatest event of time of eternity. It was the greatest expiat. Why? Because every enemy of God jumped on him in hell and said, you're staying. And God had to overcome all of his enemies in one mighty force. You say, well, Ray, all raising from the dead is the same. If you look at the other two times that Jesus raised people from the dead, the first was Jairus' daughter, she had probably been dead less than an hour. Because if you remember the story, Jairus comes to get Jesus while Jesus is talking to the woman with the issue of blood there in Mark chapter 5. five. Another person comes and says, she just died. We know that from that point, he had to walk to his house, put out the mourners, and pray for it. Probably took less than an hour. So the child's been led dead. Was she truly dead? Yes. Was it an enormous miracle? Yes. But she's been led less than an hour. The other person he raised from the dead was the widow named son. And we know in that culture, even until today, they bury within 24 hours because they have no way of preserving the body. So we don't know how long the young man had been dead, but definitely less than 24 hours. Are you following me here? When he raises Lazarus from the dead, he has got to raise somebody from the dead who is already well into decomposition. So how do you know? Because Martha says, man, don't that guy. It's going to stink. And you know what I think? I think when they opened the cave, it did stink. Because he really was dead for four days. Jesus knew in his humanity what an enormous amount of faith. It was going to take all the faith. Okay? And so why didn't he tell the disciples he's dead? He'd rather just say he's sleeping. Because he, you don't want to declare death on somebody. You've got to call him life. Okay? So watch this. So verse 11, he said, our fellow friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. In verse 12, the disciples then said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll get better. He'll recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them, Lazarus is dead. He didn't want to have to say it. He finally had to tell him, right? He, the guy's dead. And I'm glad for your sake I was not there. So that you may believe, but let us go to him. You know, those disciples are thinking, what in the world? God played hooky and he's glad. God let him die and he's glad. Has God ever been taking time in your situation and you're supposed to get happy? Every say it's not over till it's over. How many of you feel like certain parts of the dreams of your life have already died? Or perhaps there's a call on your life that you thought certainly would be fulfilled by now. When I was 20, Five, 26 years old, I knew God had a call in my life. I wasn't real crazy, but I did completely, but I knew. So I was memorizing chapters of scripture. I knew it was going to be in six months and a year at the latest, so I memorized. 20 years later, I started to preach. And he said, oh, man. I don't tell me 20 years. I'm not telling you 20 years. It took me him that long to work enough character in my life to catch up with what my head knowledge of the word was. And I'm not there yet. None of us are. Do you understand? Because we get so bent out of shape. Not, oh, we're not with God that we don't think he's going to do. But are you looking? All right. Now, Jesus, look at, there's something terribly important in this verse. He said, I'm glad for your sakes. Now, what in the world does Lazarus guy have to do with the disciples? How can he be glad for their sakes? Because in the Jewish tradition, tradition, they had a very, it wasn't in the word, but they had come up with the idea that for three days after someone dies, their soul hangs around. And then after the third day, they depart. Also, okay, so he's going to debunk that myth. But this is the bigger one. Now listen, we get the idea when we see the disciples just locked down in terror of the Romans, without hope, that he never told them that this was going to happen. He told them a minimum of six to eight times he's going to die, the dead three days, and raise from the dead. You want to see one of them? We don't have time for all of them. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. In Mark 8, verse 31, he began to teach them that the Son of Man, now, just a real question, is this subtle 
verse that's right out there. He began to teach them, his disciples, that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests, be killed, and after three days, rise again. Next verse. And he was stating the matter plainly. And Peter took him aside and started to rebuke him. He said, oh, no, you don't. Okay. Well, here's my point. The one Sunday in the old sanctuary, we just took the time on an Easter Sunday, and we read through every time. He said, look, they're going to kill me. I'll be gone three days, and I'll be back. Yeah. And after reading them, there's so much faith in the Word of God that we're saying, duh, come on, how can you stand around without any hope when it's only like six, eight times? I'll, I'll be back. Now let's go back to John 11. Question while, in verse 15. While we're going there, did they go through emotional torture those three days? Yeah. Absolutely. This was worse than losing your husband or your wife. He had become God to them. He was their yeah. master. He was the hope of their life. He was the one they lived for and with for three and a half years. Incomprehensible that he should be dead. He did not want them going through that torture. So in John eleven fifteen, he said, I'm so glad for your sakes that I was not there. Why? So that you may believe. You see, they may not have ever known anybody to be dead three days and raised from the dead. Didn't happen in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, I was looking through. Elijah raised the widow. Remember how he was at the brook sheriff that was sent to the widow of Zarephath while he was eating the meal and the oil that kept coming from the widow of Zarephath. His son died. He raised her from the dead the same day. Elisha raised the Shunammite woman sometime the same day. Er, and we, as far as we can tell, she, he died around noon. She got on a donkey, went to where he was, and he raised him up. They never had a recorded miracle of somebody being gone three days. Jesus said, I'm so glad I wasn't there because I'm going to raise him after the fourth day. And y'all ought to be able to believe. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I don't care what you're waiting for God on today. You ought to be able to believe. Amen. Say it with me. It's not over until it's over. Okay. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he gave an irrefutable evidence that God can raise men from the dead after three days. And in the darkest, in the disciples' darkest hour, it would have given God so much glory if they would have at least had hope. No matter what it is you think it's too late for in your life, if you at least have hope that God can do it, okay? Therefore, you know, as I said, he said, I don't want you to go through agony when I die. I want you to know I can do this. But now the question is, with Mary and Martha, as we go to visit them, did Mary and Martha feel like they had proof positive that God had dropped the ball when they watched Lazarus drop his last breath? Absolutely. I want to tell you something. God has not dropped the ball in your life. I don't care what has happened. Verse 16. That was really weak. Come on. Amen. Did you know the devil was screaming at them? Your best friend, your dearest friend, your master. You called him master. You said he'd be here. You trusted him. He had the power. You love Lazarus. He loved Lazarus. What's going on? What's... You know why? No, because the devil never changes. Same screeching voice in your ear tries to screech in mine. But I want to tell you something. The goodness of God and what we know about his goodness should give us faith. Yeah. Okay, verse 16. Therefore Thomas, who was called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, so that we may die with him. He's the cheery one. <laughs> so, so when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him. But Mary stayed at the house. Martha was the practical one. She was dealing with the situation. I personally think that Mary was so devastated. You know, when you got you that one with so much faith, I think she was so devastated, felt so betrayed, she didn't even think she had anything to say. Verse 21. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Question. Is she reproaching Jesus? Mm -hmm. yeah. You could have stopped it. Verse 22. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God, God will give you. I like this because even though she cannot stop those words of reproach from coming out of her mouth, she still reaffirms her faith in him. Mm -hmm. If you're in a place where you've had some disappointment, 
Uh-huh. Say all the faith you can say. Yeah. There's a lot of things you know. Right in the face of a thing where you just don't understand. Say what you do know. God, you're so good. She yeah. said, even now, I know that whatever you ask, the Father will give to you. Verse 23. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, well, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection of the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord. I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. Now, let's stop and think about what Martha said. In verse 21, she said, You could have done better than this. But if you've never been there, I'll bet you, Nico, you thought it sometimes. She doesn't lash out. Now listen. Do you know that it's just because you feel like God's let you down? God didn't get angry with you about it. Look at what she does right. She doesn't lash out. She doesn't threaten to rebel against him or stop serving him. And she reaffirms her trust. You are the Christ. To Martha's credit, she still believes when she does not understand. Now listen. Her holding steady in the face of seeming defeat, loving Jesus in spite of letting me down, if you will, produces, you see, she still says you're good. She says, I still love you. I don't understand. If you will do that, you will produce the setting for a miracle. Yeah. I know Christians that turn their back on God and get bitter. Some of them, you know, you cannot do that. When you don't understand, you say, Lord, I don't understand, but I know that you're good. Yeah. Okay? She produced the setting for a miracle and kept the door open for the miraculous. I came here to tell you that God did not let you down. He's not playing hooky. But even if you feel he's a little slow in showing up, and your timetable, his timetable is not the same with yours, if you will hold steady and glorify him and trust him, you are setting yourself a stage for a miracle. You are. Say one more time. It's not over till it's over. It's not over. Verse 28. When she, Martha, had said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, saying secretly, the teacher's here. He's calling for you. Now, why did she have to tell Mary he's calling for you? Because Mary was the one who believed and trusted. She was a spiritual one. Never doubted. And she's so heartbroken and disappointed that she hadn't even planned to go out and see him. In her heart, I think she thought, I don't have anything to say to him. But you know what? Her love for him overcame her heartbreak. Isn't that nice? Look at verse 29. When she heard it, she got up quickly and was coming to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha met him. And then the Jews who were with her in the house were consoling her. When they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. She couldn't stop the flood of reproach, could she? Maybe you and I couldn't have either. She said, how could you not have come? I trusted you and you loved him. You know, I know it's quiet in here right now because every single one of us, how many of you can say I've seen so many answers to prayer? And the truth is you don't have any clue how many answers to prayer. We just expect the covenant of God to work. We expect to get on 495 and come out alive. Now that's a close to a miracle. <laughs> I let my daughter drive on 495. You know that's a miracle of God. She must have been praying. We live in the covenant. We live having plenty to eat and a nice roof over our heads and our babies. But we expect the covenant to work. And it works time after time and day after day. And morning after morning, the sun comes up and he loves us. And we just have so many answers to prayer, we forget to write them down. Come on. When something happens that we don't understand, uh -oh. we're so quick to say, but you could have. You should have. Yeah. Some might be in situations right now where you had it figured out differently. You thought you'd already be in the ministry or that a certain dream would already be a reality. And it's taking all the self-control you can muster to say, Lord, how could you? What's going on? Mary felt all that in her emotions from everything she understood about this situation. You have to understand, at this moment, he is up there decaying. From everything she understood about the situation, she felt her trust had been betrayed, but she forgot that it's not over until it's over. Verse 33. 
When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled. And she said, Where have you and he said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. I have a question for you. Did Jesus know that 30 minutes later there was going to be enormous rejoicing? Yeah, he did. Why did he cry? I came across this scripture maybe two weeks after Gordon died. My husband passed. I was grieving. You know, you, we don't grieve like the world grieves, but we grieve. And I read this and I asked the Lord, I said, isn't this strange? He knew he was going to be raised from the dead and yet he cried. And this is what I felt the Lord said to me. He said, Denise, I didn't just cry for Mary and Martha that day. I cried for every person, every one of humanity that's ever lost a loved one. For the anguish they've been through because it wasn't meant to be that way. He cried over our heart. Do you see what I'm saying? He wasn't just, does that make sense to you? He wasn't just weeping over Mary and Martha. Because he knew good and well they were going to be jumping up and down screaming in 30 minutes or 10 minutes. He cried. How many of you have ever left somebody? Lost somebody? It was the worst pain you've ever had in your life. I want you to know Jesus cared. Amen. You see, sometimes we think he despises our weakness, but that's not true. He feels with you and me when faith, our faith is being tested. When all of our preconceived notions are shot down, he's not good to judge. He is with us there and, and holy for us. Verse 36. So the Jews were saying, see how we loved him. But some of them said, couldn't this man who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? So some of them were saying how wonderful he was, how he loved him. And the other half were saying, well, why didn't he heal him? Guess what? That division continues, and it just gets stronger and stronger after he's raised from the dead. And you say, why is that? Because if you recognize his dignity, you'll need to serve him. We'll get there in a minute. If you recognize his deity, you have to trust him with the timetable of your life. Let's say that together. If I recognize his deity, I have to trust him with the timetable of my life. So half the crowd that fought in his compassion, half were furious that he let him die, verse 38. And so Jesus, again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb, and now it was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the deceased, said, Lord, by this time there will be a stench. He's been dead four days. Boy, Martha is always the practical one. She tells it like it is. Verse 40. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? What does it take when your dream has been dead and buried four days? You ever had a dream of dead and buried four days? I felt like this church was dead and buried when Gordon died. You know, we, the whole town was saying it can't go on. You know? What does it take when it seems like your dream has been dead and buried four days when everything in you wants to say, but how could you? He said, did I not say to you, if you will believe? I don't care what's happened in your life, you can still believe God for the very best. Yeah. Okay? Hallelujah. I want to look at one scripture here. This is so important. John 6, 29, you say, well, why is this so important what we believe? Because your believing honors God or dishonors God. You see, these, this couple of ladies enormously honored the, honored the Lord Jesus in that even though they were disappointed beyond words, they didn't lash out at him. Have you ever heard people say mean, ugly things about God? How many of you know that there is not one mean, ugly thing ever said about God that he's ever deserved? No matter what happens that we don't understand, you don't have to say something mean and ugly in his feelings. This is what Jesus said about believing. He said, Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Now you have a listen, really important point. You have many things on your to-do list. How many of you already know basically what you're going to do tomorrow, blah, 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 but every hour is scheduled for you. have, I know Karen's sitting there going, I don't care. <laughs> Right at the top of your list, Jesus said, this is the work of a Christian to believe. And you say, well, what difference does it make? It's whether you honor God or dishonor God. The reason the first generation of Israelites didn't go into the promised land is because they dishonored God so bad. 
He had it in his heart to take them out of Egypt, train them for two years to trust him so that they could go in against the giants. And when they saw the giants, they said, well, you just brought us out here to kill us. They arrested him on a suspicion of first degree murder. But what is that? He says, you brought us out for the point of killing us. And finally, he said to Joshua and Caleb and Moses, I'm sorry, but we can't do this. Why? Because he's so patient. But after he, they had seen miracle and miracle and miracle, you said, yeah, but I haven't seen that many miracles. I promise you that you have seen enough miracles in your life to pass the next test because your God is so faithful. He will not allow you to be tested beyond what you're able. Amen. So the one thing you can do, even at a place where you're not sure what happens, you can say, I don't completely understand, but I know one thing will cause you to fall. I know that you're good. Yeah, I will honor you. This is the work of God that you believe. And you say, well, Pastor, I don't know how to do that work. Okay. I always tell myself at the beginning of every sermon, don't tell them what to do without telling them how to do it. I don't have anything in here to tell you how to do it. I forgot that part. But I know how. I hate it when preachers do it. I can just see. They say, this is what you need to do. And I go, yeah. Now tell me how. And they never tell you how. Anything. Well, I didn't do me any good at all. I know it's what I'm not doing right. Now listen, you want to, you cannot do the work of God without the Word of God. That's right. He says, well, I don't like the Bible that much. You better start. That's right. Yes. Amen. There, there, you can pray for faith from now until Jesus comes. Prayer draws you into fellowship, but faith comes through the Word of God. That's right. It comes from here. If you want to know what God will do in your life, you've got to open this book, uh -huh. hear from Him, write it down, and say, this is what I believe. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> So anyhow, like it or not, this is your work this week. At the top of your to-do list is to believe. Okay, let's go back to John 11. We'll wrap this up. John 11, verse 40. Jesus said, did I not say to you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. And then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. Just a quick point. When they removed that stone, do you know what that showed? It showed that they had decided to hope. Even if you think it's too late for the miracle that you need to happen, keep hope alive. You can at least hope that it's not too late. First. So they removed the stone. Jesus said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me, and I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it, so that you may believe that you sent me. They may believe. I love that verse. It's almost an insult for him to even thank the Father for hearing it. They were so close. It sounded silly to him to thank him. Of course he heard him. But he said, just so that they know that you're the one I'm in communication. Just so that they know that you're doing the miracle. Thank you for hearing me. How close they were. Verse 43. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And the man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around him with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him. And let him go. I want you to notice the time did not matter. One iota. It didn't matter. He'd been dead four days. The grave clothes binding him didn't matter. No matter what the devil said and what people said about your dream, it doesn't matter. Amen. Amen. Verse 45. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. Half of them believe. Look at the first half. Verse 45 says, Therefore many of the Jews who saw believed. And the rest of them went squealed to the Pharisees. Half of them believed and half of them rejected the idea that he was in the lead. Now I can ask you one question today. In your mind, is it good that God is God? Because worship is just... I'll tell you where the sermon came from. You know, I hate to say the sermon came from the internet, but I was... Somewhere, I'm going to spend a lot of time on it, but it, I saw this video where this kid had made a, a video that these, everybody was applauding. I didn't actually watch the video, but I saw the blurb underneath it. It was called, When I Become the Sovereign of the Universe. Uh -huh. And all these adults were laughing at the things he would do. They thought it was so cute and so clever and so ingenious. And I thought, I don't really want to watch it. I don't care how clever or how cute or ingenious this is. This is the basic problem of mankind, is wanting to be the sovereign of the universe. Yeah. Why can the women in Hollywood not handle it when they lose their looks? 
I mean, they're suicidal when they lose their looks. Why? Because they, in their minds, have received a form of worship by being so beautiful. It is a sin to want to be worshipped for being beautiful or for being powerful or for being rich. I know it's quiet in here. You weren't meant to be worshipped. Why do we want to be famous? In a way, it's wanting to be a, it's a form of worship. I'm here to tell you, if you're not okay that God is God, then it's time to stop everything. Because faith says that he is and he rewards those who seek him. Yeah. And when you know that he loves you, his, he, he did not delay two days down there to hurt Mary and Martha. No. He delayed two days so that more people would come to him. Many more believed. And if you'll watch, this, this whole thing um, agitated or became the catalyst for Palm Sunday. It just became too much. It was like a tipping point. And everybody had to choose sides. Yeah. And some of them chose the side, let's get a group to crucify him. But another chose the side to worship him. Yeah. He did not allow that to hurt Mary and Martha. It was something they had to go through to accomplish the purposes of God. Amen. There's been things in my life I have waited on and waited on and I got so mad. And I'm not proud of it. Man, I was waiting on my little girl. I was ticked. <laughs> And I'm not proud of it. But you know, I, oh, come on. You all are so out there. <laughs> not me, Pastor. <laughs> no, I just had a few things in my life. That after Gordon was sick in 1990, he determined he had to live on the water. That was the only way he would regain his forces after chemotherapy. Okay, so I'm in favor of anything to help him feel good again. So we bought a trailer. And that's not against living in a trailer, but it wasn't my dream home. And he promised me two years and we'll buy a house. Well, two years came and went. And three years came and went. And you say, at this point, I feel like my husband lied to me. I feel like God has let me do all you say. I know, looking back, it is not a big deal. I were there four years. You say, did that kill you? No, I was living, I was my missionary friend in Guatemala reminded me I was living better than 90% of the world. And that's sure we had, we were comfortable. I mean, but you can look at something and see what you think you deserve and get so upset you forget how good God has been to you. Uh -huh. And the other has been with my daughter. I was I prayed seven years for a little girl. And you said, well, you didn't have her. Yes, I do. I can show you a scripture. It says Psalm 113 says he takes the barren woman and, and makes her abide in the house. It's the joyful mother of children, plural. Oh. And I said, you may not have promised me nine. I don't know how many's in that children. But you promised me two because Nathan's a child, not a children. And I love Nathan so much I couldn't bear him not have another baby. And I got right, I know you've read me, but I got right in the face of God for seven years. And you see, I was not happy. I had it all planned. My kids would be two years apart and be so close. Well, you can see they get along pretty good. But here's the point. When my husband died, about a month later, I thought, oh, I'm so glad. Because Nathan's not going to leave home pretty soon. I'm so glad she's not about ready to leave home. I'm so glad the Lord waited. And I, I did some profuse apologizing to Jesus. Yeah. Because, you see, I didn't think I knew better. I knew I knew better. Uh -oh. Now, there's certain things that you know you know better than the way God, God's got things planned. I'm telling you, he hasn't dropped any balls. He knows every single little thread in the back weaving of your life. If a call of God is taking longer on your life to fulfill, he has his reasons. Doesn't bother him a bit. One year, ten, a year, a day. This is a thousand years in God's sight. A thousand years. This is a day. He said, "I don't like that." Well, now we're, we're back to when you become the song. Uh oh. He said, "Why in the world are you preaching this?" Well, first of all, I saw that video. It made me mad because, first of all, Hollywood is extremely deceptive. They're not telling you that they're teaching they're teaching you to worship those people and longing to be worshipped, but that's what they're doing. Okay. Yeah. You weren't created to be worshipped, you were created to worship. That's right. But the other reason is that next Sunday, I have a question for you. What can you teach on on Palm Sunday except worship? Jesus said if you shut up the rocks you're gonna cry out. Yeah. So we could study Leviticus, but I think I'd rather just worship next Sunday. Yeah. And whenever we come it's very hard to get to a place where we are 100% wholehearted, abandoned, no questions asked, just adoration. You know why? Because in the back of our minds, 
We have a collection of two or three questions. Please say. I really worship you. If. Uh oh. And guess what? We're not allowed that. You remember? Okay, I gotta bring up it. You remember the dad told you? I was. I was. I finally began to see the error of my way after I got totally bent out of shape over living four house in a very nice mobile home. You know how petty that is, how childish. Then I got very bent out of shape. We were waiting seven years for a daughter that I'm glad came when she came. So, okay. I thought, you know, maybe, maybe he's smarter than I am. <laughs> Nate, okay. Yeah. So I got myself a little envelope in my heart. Now you can't see it in my heart. But I have a collection of two, three questions that to this day, I prayed for somebody and thought it would turn out one way, it turned out another. I don't know why. But I'm, bit, I'm well convinced he didn't drop the ball. Yeah. All right. And you, if you don't get there to where you have a few questions that, if he ever wants to chat someday in heaven, I might just bring them up. But it's not going to be the first thing I bring up. Yeah. This, I heard the testimony of a man who was privileged, quote unquote, to go to hell. He saw hell. <laughs> and then Jesus appeared and delivered him from there. And he, and he said, I had this whole list of questions I was going to ask Jesus. And he said, after I saw hell, all I could say is thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm convinced. You see, the most marvelous thing that could happen is if we got a grasp of his goodness and could walk in the next Sunday, just forget what anybody said, and worship with the entire fervency of our being, because even then it would not be what he deserves. But to do that, you're going to have to take your top three lists of questions that you'd like to say, Lord, if you had been here, and say, okay, let's be honest. I don't know what happened, but I'm not going to... You see, I don't want to spend the rest of my life angry because I'm living in less than what I want to live in. I don't want to spend the rest of my life angry that I'm waiting on an answer. I always did believe I was going to have my girl. I just was mad enough at the time. It, I cost myself sweet, sweet fellowship time with God. Because of anger. And what I'm saying is, if you could come to a place where you understand, he didn't have like five motives in his heart toward you. Where he pretty much loves you, but he's got it in for you. Oh, no, no. He loves you. Yeah. We're going to close completely different than what I had written down. Um, could we go to Psalm 136? How many of you believe the whole Bible? in here if there's anything else I'm too good to leave out. There's one other thing about timing I want to read to you. Then we're going to read a song. And in this song, every other line says the exact same thing. For I don't know how many verses, 23 verses. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. you got to believe that to get your miracle. You got it. Okay. I want to talk to you, read you one part of the sermon to close up about timing. I think it will help you. We're here today because we agree that Jesus of Nazareth is the Lord of heaven and earth. Now I have a question that might seem unusual as I already asked. Is God, is it good in your sight that he is God? Why? It's terribly important. This is the most important question you'll ever ask because you say, but I'm a Christian. That's good. That's good. Uh -huh. You've made arrangements to go to heaven. But is it really, really, really good in your sight that he is God? If you wish you were. Come on. When you call him and say, Lord, we need you here now. And he waits two days. Come on. And when he says, it's okay, it's not unto death, but I have a slightly different plan. Do you trust him enough with your life to redraw the timetable of your life and subsequently work things out for his greater glory? Terribly important. Yeah, it is. I've known people miss the whole plan of God in their lives because they were myth that it didn't turn out exactly the, according to their preconceived desire and notion. I should reread that whole last part. Is it good in your sight that he is God? Is, are you okay with him having a slightly different timetable? Do you trust him when he redraws it? Next Sunday, Palm Sunday, we'll talk about worship. But as I say, you've got to become okay with that. I just want you to think about this. 
Abraham had to give glory to God even after he had waited 20 years for Isaac. Was God dishonest? No. Was he faithful? Yes. Was it a tremendous miracle that a man 100 and the, and the lady 90? And he said, well, he didn't have time to enjoy it. He lived to 169. You look at the book of Job and you say, oh, what he went through. He went through all of that in no more than 18 months. A lot of people think about 12 months. It was a terrible time. But he lived another, what, 130 years? He got everything back twice over. He had a great life. If you had seen him, he was the richest man on the planet. You know, he would not feel bad about it. All right? Joseph. Joseph had to trust God after he had been a slave and then a prisoner and a slave. The, the butler said, okay. You remember he, he interpreted the butler's dream? He went back to where Pharaoh said, I'll, I'll mention this to Pharaoh. For God. For two more years, Joseph is down there. How easy would it have been for him to get bitter against God? Saying, you gave me hope. And he forgot. Hey, listen, listen. Everybody say it's not over until it's over. It's and just a quick question. Did it look over down there in that rat and fest just It looked over. Yeah. But listen, Pharaoh had the dream of yeah. the fat cows eating the skinny cows and fat grains eating the skinny grain the night that Joseph needed to get out of prison, the night before he needed, because when he got out, it was right at the beginning of the seven years of plenty and after the seven years of famine. He was sent for the purpose of saving the chosen race, the messianic race, from total annihilation in that famine. They were dying of hunger if they hadn't had Egypt to go to. And if Egypt hadn't had plenty of food, they wouldn't have given any. Come on. Did he go with a purpose? Yes. Was that purpose ready as the butler's promotion? No. Ready two years later. No. Right. I'm just saying, is that I don't like, listen, can you get to a place where God is so good in your sight that you trust him with timing like you trust him with everything else? Yeah. Hallelujah. You say, when will I, my answer come? Exactly when Jesus came. Look at Galatians 4.6. We'll come back to this in a second. Look at Galatians 4.6. It says, in, because we are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his sons into our Father. Probably I'll be five, but guess what? I went on my memory there, I'll bet. This is what it says. It says, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. You want me to look at that verse? It's in Galatians 4, I'm pretty sure. Anybody got it? It's 4-4, four, four, I'm sorry. I went on memory and I was wrong. Galatians 4-4 four, four says, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son. Now here's my point. If you had gone to the Israelite people 300 years before Jesus came, Malachi had been written. The last book of the Old Testament was written about 400 B.C. 300 B.C., they're saying, where's your God playing hooky? Uh, 200 B.C., where's your God? Don't know yet. 100 B.C., I don't know if he's even coming. Come on. But the fullness of time he came. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hmm. Joseph got delivered at the right time. Last thing I was thinking about was... Um, Ahasuerus forgot to reward Mordecai. Yeah. Remember? Yeah. Oh, that's a terrible oversight. You say, well, that's not right. You forgot to get blessed. The guys are telling him. Remember how Mordecai saved Ahasuerus' life? Guess when Ahasuerus read the, read the books and said oh. never the night he was supposed to get hung. That's pretty good timing. Yeah. Everybody say, it's not over till it's over. It's over, til it's over. Now, here's the two things. The devil tries to to keep you from worshiping God. Number one is timing. And below that is the goodness of God, the motives of God heart, God's heart. If there's a delay, is it because he loves you? Now you read this with me and you read the second part of the verse. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Then read, for his loving kindness. Next verse. Give thanks to the God of gods. Don't get bored. He wants you to know this. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords. To him who alone does great wonders. To him who made the heavens with skill. God. Do you understand what that verse says? Why did he make the heavens so beautiful? Back during the hurricane, we had all the lights up. Were the heavens beautiful? You can see all the stars. Why did he do that? Because of his love for you. Next verse. To him who spread out the earth above the waters. Why? For his to him who made the great lights. Why? For his 
the sun to rule by day. Why? I say this is boring. It's not supposed to be boring. You're supposed to get some of this. Next verse. The moon and the stars to rule by night. Why? To him who smote the Egyptians of their firstborn. Why? He loved his people. And he brought out Israel from their midst. Why? With a strong hand and a stretched out arm. You want to read the rest of you getting bored? Okay, let's read it. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder. Why? And made Israel pass through the midst of it. He overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea. Why? To him who led his people through the wilderness. Why? To him who smote great kings, why? And he slew mighty kings, why? <laughs> Sion, king of the Amorites, why? All king of Bashan, why? He, he gave them their land as a heritage, why? Even a heritage to Israel, his servant. Why? Who remembered us in our low estate. Why? He's rescued us from our adversaries. How come? Who gives food to all flesh? You should be hungry enough to be thankful for that one. Give thanks. Why should we give thanks to the God of heaven? Now listen, why did he stay two days longer? Why is he taking his time with something you don't understand? What's the only motive he has in his heart? I beg God I should read it again. <laughs> It's not over till it's over. Let's say it five times. It's not over till it's over. It's not over till it's over. It's not over till it's over. Not over till it's over.